Hello and welcome to the Real Influencers Project. I am your host, Craig Reynolds, along with one of my childhood friends and, yeah, guest heroes, Mr. Billy Griggs. Bill, how are you today? Good. How's it going, man? Glad to be here. Thanks for having I'm, me. I'm doing well. You know, I think about influencers and to me, it's the people that we grew up with, people that, you know, you hung out with in high school, um, your friends, your family, uh, your neighbors. But I think today when people look at influencers, they think of social media and what they're selling and peddling on there, whether it's a lifestyle, it's health and fitness, um, you know, whatever it may be, you don't really get that one-on-one -on -one touch with that, with that crowd. Um, so for me, I like to know who in your life was your influence. Um, and Billy, with you know, your celebrity, I mean, being inducted into the BMX Hall of Fame in 2013, I believe, um, yeah. you've been around for a while and you've seen a lot. Um, yeah. so first and foremost, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Anaheim, California, um, was born in Anaheim, uh, lived here, um, my whole life, still live here today. So just can't, can't seem to get out of Anaheim. <laughs> so growing up, I always noticed that you had a sense of style about you, um, on the track one of the most stylish riders ever, bike always dialed and clean, um, but off the track as well. Always had, you know, the right gear on and one of the coolest mini trucks I think I've ever seen. <laughs> what got you to that point? Like who was that influence for you growing up? Because you came in at such an early age of BMX that I don't necessarily know if there was a whole bunch of, of heroes to look up to. And yeah. you don't realize it maybe, but I think in real time, we don't realize that you know, we are heroes to other people and we have influence to other people. Um, so who was that for you? Well, I think when I was a kid, um, you know, I, I traveled summers when I was out of school. And I mean, a kid before I started racing BMX, like eight, nine, 10 years old. And um, my dad was a, a long haul truck driver. He was in the furniture business. So he wasn't like a dock to dock um, long haul trucker. He was um, a, a, a mover. And so you know, he shows up to somebody's house and loads their life into his truck and then is like, bye, I'll see you later with all your stuff cross country when we get there. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, there's this customer service, like professionalism aspect to that type of, of specificity in, in long haul trucking. Um, and he always showed up with a perfect shirt. The truck was gorgeous and clean and, you know, he presented um, security with that professionalism to, to who the, the, you know, the shipper was. And um, I think that that was my first exposure to if you're a professional, you present everything to the best of your ability because people are going to make this perception of how serious you are um, and how mm -hmm safe in that manner you are and you know all their thoughts and concerns so it was definitely an example set by my father to me um, and then of course when we started racing um, he was always very particular about keeping my bike running right right because he yeah. um, he viewed that as we're taking all of the excuses out of the game here you know your free wheel is going to spin really good your chain yeah. is going to be really lube your wheels are going to be straight all these things, you know, and, and the bike will be clean too, because, you know, even, you know, that was just him. That was who he was, you know, his 18 wheeler right. at Kenworth was always polished and shiny. So my bike was always polished and shiny. Just that's how it went. Of all the photos and magazines I've seen of you, I've never seen your bike dirty. Even if there was a mud race, your <laughs> bike was immaculate. And for some reason, it's like your hubs would always shine. Like they were the stars. Yeah. I don't understand it, but yeah. your bike was always always yeah. on point and, and you rode for some some of the most iconic brands as well and that carried over um yeah. that lesson that your dad taught you how have you brought that into your your life today i mean i see your gym in the background it looks perfect back there I, yeah. i'd like to sign up to your gym let me get off the phone i'll send in my payment yep sure that'd be great we'd love <laughs> to have you over here <laughs> so what are you doing today that you've taken that lesson and you apply it which I'm sure, you know, Razor, who you work for now, has got to really love that. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes uh, I, I think just sometimes it can be to a fail. Um, there's no question that 
that wanting to have like our work environment and our shop clean and the tools all put away. I mean, cause it just all, it all just rolled over from keeping your bike and your gear and your, your Kenworth, you know, uh, clean to like in the back of my dad's trailer, the, all the moving pads were all folded and put away and stored. And like, he always knew mm. how many pads were available. And so I'm like that with my work environment. Um, so at, at Razor sometimes, you know, I might be a little too concerned with having the shop and our work area the office and everything clean and detailed and and organized um maybe to a point of fail of just get to work and get something done <laughs> and stop <laughs> right. worrying about how clean the shop is but um no i think that there's levels of perfection from um from me for like detail i i, w I shouldn't say perfection i should say detail levels of detail that i think catch a lot of things that might go unmissed um from being uh you know so a, a sample from the factory or even just in an initial concept or design there's just details that i'm always looking at um you know examples don't really come to mind at the moment but you know um you know just how easy is something to work on you know because a lot of times with our electric dirt bikes you know it's like oh well somebody might want to you know i'm always trying to put little um little design cues into the razor stuff for the people that know, like if you know, you know, we're right. a mass market toy company, but some of our electric dirt bikes, like the one we do with Jeremy McGrath, like we know that somebody that has a good toolbox in their garage might be buying that and they might want right. to tinker on it. So mm -hmm. I try to slip stuff in little details and I fight for little details. Like you can put a mountain bike shock. If you have an extra good high end mountain bike shock yes. that may be uh -huh. gated, you can put that on your McGrath, um, you know, Razor electric dirt bike. And right. we have we have handlebars and, and bar clamps that if you want to put your tall BMX bar on, you can do that. So, like, those are little details that I go the extra mile for. And that's just me being, you know, w w again, wanting to, like, sort of give people opportunities to work on things. But me also wanting it to be the way I would want. Like, if I was right. buying this, what would I want? That's so, you know. That's, the quality that's, control, that's yeah, quality control is next level, and the, and the presentation still goes throughout the entire ownership of of the product that you're making now. Yep, yep. And now I know you know later in life you're you're heavily into physical fitness now as well. You were always yeah. fit, one of the strongest dudes when we were racing as well. But now things have changed. Was there an influence for you in that aspect as uh, as you are now? Um, there certainly was in the eighties. Like when I turned pro, I had this, like, um, you know, as an amateur, I was always pretty good at just riding and, and my skill got me a long way. Um, but then when I turned pro, I realized that I wasn't going to get there just on skill because everybody's a beast, right? I've got Sean Texas right. and I've got Pete Longkarevich and I've got Greg Hill and I'm looking at these guys and, you know, you, you see this physical strength. <laughs> Charles Towns and Terry Tanet. I mean, I was a runt. I was a runt when I got on the gate and double A my rookie hey, year. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think that I think that looking at what being not just a BMX racer, but a true professional athlete um, was going to entail. Um, I think that the guys I just all mentioned were examples to me of, you, you know, you're going to have to like maybe go to Sheep Hills a little bit less and spend some time in the gym and, and get some strength. And um, I had not really lifted much when I was, you know, I mean, a little bit in high school, like, you know, you get a football coach that's going to give you some tips and advice. But, right. you know, like uh, at that point, I just want to ride. I want to ride. I want to get my driver's license. You know, when you're a teenager, you're just right. in a different headspace. And, um, I was going to say, so a different mindset. <laughs> yep. So um, for, for, for me, I, I think just turning pro and everybody that I lined up with that towered over me made me go, you know what, you're going to have to figure this out because this is going to be the sink or swim for you. So, right. Um, yeah. Um, Definitely in the same boat with that one as well. I remember while getting up, uh, walking up to the back of the starting out the grands one day, uh, ABA grands thinking these guys are monsters. This is another level. Okay. And it was my first ABA grands as a double A pro. And I'm like, whoa we got to go back to the lab and figure this out. Right. Right. So, so yeah, I, um, I wound up kind of finding, I thought what was a nice, uh, a nice sort of middle ground between the weightlifting and the riding. Like I never 
started lifting so much and getting so jacked and strong and big that that it uh, I think affected my riding style. I think everything that I did when I trained just complemented my riding style. Yep. You know, I think about some of the some of the photos looking back to like ninety or ninety one and you know, I was about the, the biggest and strongest I ever got as a double A at that point, you know, a good three, three years into when I started really training. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that it affected my ability to jump or, you know, have a good photo shoot, you know, and, and that right. was something I didn't want to sell out. Um, I didn't want to sell out. I wanted to make sure that, that I stayed true to my passion for riding and being a good rider. And I you know, just wanted to compliment it with, with some extra strength. Well, that most certainly was the case because I never saw a bad photo. I don't know if I've ever even seen it squirrely. So even bigger and stronger, you were still together. They exist. <laughs> I was just lucky they never published them. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Billy, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so yep. much. Um, it's fantastic to hear about how Billy became the Billy that he is, man. All that attention yeah. to detail and, and learning from your father, that is fantastic. And obviously picking up tips and tricks from the, the bigger, stronger guys when, when you turn double A. So um, thank you again. Um, if all my viewers out here um, like what you're seeing, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. Uh, so that'll be alerted every time that we put up a new post. So uh, again, Billy, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everyone, thanks for tuning my in. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time.